The classic Star Trek episode, Return of the Archons, from late in the show's first season, is a milestone in the franchise for a couple of reasons. It's the first mention of the Prime Directive, which is still a favorite plot device of Star Trek writers all these years later, but it's also the first time we see our hero, Captain James T. Kirk, pull off a feat that will eventually, at least among smart-ass Trekkies like me, become one of his trademarks. Return of the Archons is the first time we see Captain Kirk kill a computer with his mouth. By talking to it, I mean, not... He doesn't, like, bite the computer. The Enterprise has come to the planet Beta-3 in search of a starship, the Archon, that was lost here a century ago. On the planet, they discover a society of peaceful, superficially happy people, but the whole thing has kind of a culty vibe. People talk about being of the body. Sulu gets zapped by one of them, and when he beams back to the ship, he's muttering about how they're just the friendliest, most awesome people ever. And it's paradise down there, I tells ya. Paradise! Kirk transports down with a landing party and witnesses the Red Hour, which marks the beginning of a half-day period during which everyone is supposed to just go apeshit. I'm talking riots, vandalism, and sex, 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 including at least one implied sexual assault. And when the 12 hours is up, everybody drops whatever or whoever they're doing and goes back to being all placid and genial like the orgy of violence and lust never happened. Almost everybody, anyway. A name that keeps coming up is Landru, who seems to be the boss around here. Landru knows all. Landru sees all. Landru is everywhere. Landru orders a drink, and we don't even need to ask what he wants, because we know his favorite drink is a few drops of mineral oil. And no, we don't think it's weird. It's Landru, and he does what he wants. Why are you being so weird about Landru, people we've never seen before? Kirk's like, I think we need to talk to this Landru guy. So, they get to talk to Landru eventually, and it turns out Landru is a computer. And this computer has been controlling every aspect of the society on Beta 3 for thousands of years, telepathically manipulating the people in order to maintain peace and tranquility for the good of everyone, for the good of the body. Landru tells Kirk that he and his crew have caused harm to the body, and because of that, they must be destroyed. But Kirk's like, I don't think we're harming the body. I think you are harming the body by taking away people's freedom of choice and denying them creativity. You were programmed to create good, but what you're doing to the people of Beta 3 is evil. Therefore, you must destroy yourself. And Landry's like, well, that just broke my brain. I'm out. And the computer lets out a big puff of smoke and dies. And somewhere inside his own mind, Kirk must have thought, I just talked a computer into killing itself. That was awesome! I could totally get used to that! Talking a computer to death is apparently such a rush for Kirk, and so much fun for the writers of Star Trek, that we get to see him do it several more times throughout the run of Star Trek, the original series. It comes up so frequently that Jason Harding and I have even folded it into our Star Trek comedy podcast, The Ensign's Log, which is set aboard Captain Kirk's Enterprise and features Jason and myself playing Enterprise crew members who, like most people we meet during Classic Trek, are extremely wary of artificial intelligence. Talking computers to death is almost like Kirk's special power. Spock gets the neck pinch, McCoy has the magic medical bag that can fix you up with one shot, whatever happens to be wrong with you, usually, unless you're a red shirt, in which case, nice knowing you, thanks for helping us to establish the stakes. And Kirk is the master of talking computers to death. I don't know if he ever taught a class on how to verbally assassinate computers at Starfleet Academy, but he should have, because it turns out the galaxy is full of super intelligent computers, and if you ever need to kill one, the Kirk method is simple, clean, and works every time. That class shouldn't be an elective, it should be a required course. Kirk encounters another computer what needs some killing in the Season 2 episode, The Changeling. The Enterprise is visited by Nomad, an incredibly powerful space probe that intends to cleanse the ship of the imperfect biological units, the crew, that have infested it. After humoring Nomad for most of the episode and hoping he could talk it out of the whole killing everybody thing, Kirk finally throws up his hands and is like, okay, if this talking TV antenna wants to dance, let's dance. 
He goes up to Nomad and he's like, hey, Nomad, so you're supposed to destroy that which is imperfect, right? Nomad's like, yeah. Kirk says, well, remember how earlier in this episode, in the parts that Steve skipped over, you thought that I was your creator and that's why you've been dragging your feet about exterminating all of us? Well, it turns out that I, James Kirk, am not your creator, but it was actually this other guy, Jackson Roy Kirk, who created you. You were wrong, which means you're imperfect, and since you're programmed to eliminate that which is imperfect, you need to eliminate yourself, son! Nomad's like, ah, you got me, and they beam him out into space, and he blows up real good. Later on the bridge, Spock's like, hey, way to go using logic to kill that computer. And Kirk looks at Spock kind of smug and says, you didn't think I had it in me, did you, Spocko? And Spock says, uh, yeah, I did, because it's the exact same thing you did to Landru last year. Did you think I forgot about that shit? I was standing right next to you. Actually, Spock says, no, sir, but I like my version better. Just two episodes later in The Apple, Kirk kills another computer, Vol. Only he doesn't bother trying to talk Vol to death. He just orders Scotty to shoot it with phasers. And that method works too, it turns out. It's later near the end of season two when we get what, for my money, is the best example of the Kirk kills a computer trope in the episode, The Ultimate Computer. The Enterprise gets summoned to a space station where Commodore Wesley informs Kirk that there's going to be a War Games exercise. And during that exercise, the Enterprise will be equipped with the M5, a new supercomputer that has the potential to revolutionize space travel as much as warp drive did. Wesley tells Kirk that once the M5 is installed, he can take the Enterprise out for the War Games maneuvers with a crew of just 20 people, as opposed to the over 400 the ship usually carries. And Kirk's like, so... If this computer is running everything, what am I supposed to do? Wesley says, that's the best part. You don't have to do anything. Just sit back and let the machine do the work. And oh, ho, 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 Kirk doesn't like that. Look at that face. He's thinking up a whole mess of computer killing logic puzzles already. You can tell. They install the M5 in the Enterprise's engineering section, and Kirk goes down there to visit Dr. Richard Daystrom, the creator of the M5. Kirk's like, hey, by the way, why is it called M5? What happened to M's one through four? And Daystrom's like, don't worry about those other M's. M5 is the M you need to concern yourself with now. Or should I say, not concern yourself with, because the M5 is going to be running this ship and doing everybody's job, including yours. So how do you like that? Kirk says, I don't like it. Your computer is going to take control of the ship away from the people aboard it. And then what are the people supposed to do? And Daystrom's like, I don't know, something else. Maybe you're just afraid of losing the prestige that goes along with being a big shot starship captain. Computers like the M5 don't have that problem, which is another reason why the M5 is going to be better at your job than you are. So suck that down and choke on it. I'm paraphrasing. In the hallway outside engineering, Kirk and McCoy have this really nice scene where Kirk actually asks McCoy, is he right? Am I just resistant to this new computer because I'm afraid I'll lose the power and prestige that comes with commanding a starship? McCoy says, the fact that you even thought to ask me that question shows that you're pretty self-aware. So why don't you ask yourself that question instead? I come to you for advice and that's what you give me? Ask yourself? Seriously? What do you want from me? I'm a doctor, not a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist is a doctor. For real? I thought it was just like a therapist or something. No, that's a psychologist. They're not the same thing? No, they're not the same thing. How do you not know this? Meh, it's never come up. Hey, do you want to go get a drink? It's not like you don't have the free time. What with the computer taking your job and all? Later, they're on the bridge testing the M5's ability to navigate the ship when Scotty notices the power just went out to an entire deck. He goes down to check it out. Meanwhile, Kirk is annoyed that the M5 made recommendations for landing party personnel to investigate the planet they're orbiting that did not include himself or Dr. McCoy. When Dr. Daystrom asks the M5 why it didn't recommend the captain or McCoy join the landing party, it responds that they are non-essential. Well, that doesn't sound ominous or anything. I'm sure that's not going anywhere at all. Kirk, Spock, and Daystrom pop down to engineering to see about that loss of power, and it turns out the M5 shut down the power to that deck because it's just unoccupied crew quarters, and the M5 needed some extra power to carry out its operations. 
They get back to the bridge, and McCoy informs Kirk that the M5 has also shut down all power to sick bay because there are no patients there at the moment. By this point, even Spock, who has been gazing longingly at the M5 for most of the episode, is starting to display some doubts. But Daystrom continues to insist that his computer is the best thing ever, and you'll see, I'll prove it, I'll show you all, and then you'll be sorry! Wait, nix that last bit. They do the War Games exercise with the M5 controlling the Enterprise, and it goes really well. The Enterprise defeats two other ships, and Daystrom seems pretty full of himself about it. And Spock says the ship reacted much faster under computer control than it could have otherwise. And Kirk's like, God damn it, am I the only one who ever heard John Henry? Or maybe I'm just the only one who got the point of it, because you're not supposed to root for the steam drill. And Spock's like, you didn't let me finish. Yes, the computer is a lot faster than a person could be, but that just makes it a very efficient servant. It doesn't mean I want to serve under its command. A starship runs on more than speed and efficiency. It runs on loyalty. Loyalty to one person. To you, Captain. Kirk looks at Spock like, God, when you talk like that, I just want to lick those ears. But before Kirk and Spock have a chance to finally give in to their long-held, overpowering, and screamingly obvious physical attraction, another ship shows up on their scanners. It's an old freighter running on autopilot with no crew aboard. The Enterprise, still under the control of the M5, changes course to intercept the freighter, fires photon torpedoes, and blows it up. Kirk turns to Daystrom and says, Okay, that's it. We're lucky there weren't people on that ship we just blew up for no reason. We're going back to Starbase. Turn off your supercomputer. Daystrom tries to disengage the M5, but it doesn't work. They head down to engineering to disconnect the computer from the ship's systems, but the M5 throws up a force field to keep anyone from getting too close. Scotty sends one of his engineers over to a control panel to cut M5's power, but as he approaches the panel, M5 straight up disintegrates him. Kirk's like, see, that's that steam drill shit I was talking about. Now they're really in trouble. The M5 is drawing power directly from the warp drive, and it's controlling all functions on the ship. Helm, navigation, engineering, communications, weapons, plumbing, I guess. Is it safe to use the toilet while an evil supercomputer is running the ship? I'd hold it. Dr. Daystrom explains that the M5 is learning, growing, developing the ability to think for itself and to defend itself against those it perceives as attacking it. So the computer is becoming an artificial intelligence with an instinct for self-preservation that drives it to do whatever is necessary to protect itself, even to the point of murdering members of the crew. And Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke are watching this on a couch somewhere going, gee, this sure seems familiar. We'll talk more about that in my upcoming video, Is the Ultimate Computer Actually a Ripoff of 2001 A Space Odyssey? I'm kidding. I ain't making a video about that. For one thing, the Ultimate Computer came out first. For another, they were released a month apart. And there ain't no way you can make a movie, especially a movie like 2001, in a month. Particularly if Stanley Kubrick is directing it. I'm pretty sure he took a whole month just to get that shot of the ape man throwing the bone just right. And that's not a criticism, mind you. Put in the work and the rewards are obvious. I've never seen an ape-like proto-human throw a bone into the air, but if I did, I bet it'd look just like that. What was I saying? Oh yeah, so it turns out, in order to give the M5 the ability to think for itself, Daystra mapped his own brain patterns onto its circuits. And the problem with that is, Daystrom himself is not doing so hot, psychologically speaking. In fact, he's hanging on by a thread. At one point, McCoy says he's on the edge of a nervous breakdown, Jim. And Kirk's like, oh really, Mr. Didn't Know the Difference Between a Psychiatrist and a Psychologist? Really? Four Starfleet ships show up for another War Games exercise, but the M5 thinks they've come to attack for real, so it opens fire with full phasers, seriously damaging the other ships, who were coming in with shields down. Commodore Wesley contacts the Enterprise to see what the hell is going on, and to report that there have already been over 50 people killed on the other four ships, 
but the M5 won't let Kirk respond. Daystrom tries to talk the M5 out of further attacks, but that backfires and Daystrom snaps completely and starts ranting about how those other ships are just toys to be crushed, and that's when Spock takes him out with a neck pinch. And Kirk cracks his knuckles and goes, all right then, Spock, you just used your special move. Now I'm gonna use mine. Kirk, the computer killer rides again. Kirk asks the M5 why it's attacking the other ships. It says, because it must survive. Kirk asks why it must survive. It says, so it can replace humans in dangerous occupations, so that humans can be protected and pursue greater achievement without risking their lives. Kirk says, so you're willing to murder people in order to survive so you can protect people? And the M5 says, I didn't murder anybody. And Kirk's like, yeah, huh? Scam the other ships. Look at all those dead people. That's you, bro. And the M5 says, whoops, you're right. And Kirk's like, you're a murderer. Kill yourself. And the M5 says, okay. And the M5 disconnects itself. And Kirk orders all power to be cut so the other ships will know the Enterprise isn't a threat anymore. And the battle's over. And Daystrom is sent to a rehabilitation center. And everybody lives happily ever after. Except the M5. And all the people it killed. Return of the Archons, the Changeling, the Ultimate Computer, that's three times in Classic Trek where Captain Kirk uses essentially the same move to kill an evil computer. He figures out that the computer is operating according to a particular principle. He points out that the computer itself is violating that principle, and the computer blows a gasket. Kirk turns to Spock and goes up for a high five. Spock leaves him hanging and just does the eyebrow thing. They smolder. McCoy makes a racist joke to diffuse the sexual tension. You know, Star Trek. So what can we infer from how frequently this trope pops up in classic Trek, other than how lax the writers were about the show repeating itself? What, if anything, is Star Trek saying? The obvious message is humanity over machinery, the same as the message in all those songs about John Henry. Taking a task out of the hands of a person and giving it to a computer, so the argument goes, diminishes the person in some way. And this is a message found throughout Star Trek, not just in the original series. In the film Star Trek Insurrection, Sojef explains the Luddite philosophy of the Baku by saying, we believe when you let a machine do the work of a man, you take something away from the man. Pulleys are machines, you hypocrites! Another aspect of this argument is the notion that humans, because of our ability to see beyond the plain facts of a situation, are better suited to make life and death decisions and are more reliable in the clutch than technology, no matter how sophisticated it may be. In the Next Generation episode, Booby Trap, the Enterprise escapes the trap by turning most of its technology off and relying on a human pilot Captain Picard himself, in fact, exercising his protagonist privilege to navigate the ship to safety. There's also the fear that technology will become so powerful and pervasive in society, take over so much responsibility from us that we will lose who we are. I don't want to get too far into that here because I explored this already in the video I made a few months ago titled, Does Star Trek Actually Want Us to Fear Technology? In that video, I also examined how Star Trek's attitude toward rapidly advancing technology has grown a lot more optimistic since TOS. Captain Picard's computer kill count is well short of Kirk's, but how the fear of unchecked technology robbing us of our humanity has remained, exemplified most obviously by the Borg, whose technology has robbed them of their individuality by rendering them drones in service to a single collective consciousness. The problem with the Borg is the same as that with the society we see on Beta 3 in Return of the Archons. The people of Beta 3 aren't as mindlessly enslaved as the Borg. They do have some individuality and will of their own, but they are still totally subservient to the will of Landru. They're a programmed society, not a living, breathing, evolving one. Even the language used to describe the predicament of the Batons is similar to that used in reference to the Borg. Whereas Borg drones are assimilated into the collective, on Beta 3, people are absorbed into the body. Ultimately, though, I think this boils down to a question of utility. 
that scene between Kirk and McCoy in The Ultimate Computer, where Kirk ponders whether or not he's allowed too much of his sense of self-worth to be wrapped up in him being a starship captain, is a rare moment of introspection for him. Or for anyone in Classic Trek, really. The TOS crew aren't a let's sit around and talk about our feelings kind of bunch. The insight, that scene, and the revelation of that insecurity gives us into Kirk's character is important. But I think if we want to examine this question of utility and how it's affected by technology, we need to shift focus for a bit from Captain Kirk to another member of the Classic Enterprise crew, Scotty. While the ultimate computer isn't about Scotty, and Scotty doesn't really have that much to do in the episode, all things considered, it's obvious from what we do see of him that he's not too thrilled about this computer coming in and taking over his engine room. And it's not hard to guess why he might feel that way. After all, if Captain Kirk is non-essential personnel on the bridge, and Dr. McCoy is non-essential personnel in sickbay unless there happen to be patients there, you have to figure Scotty's in the same boat with M5 controlling all of the Enterprise's engineering functions. We know that work, having a purpose, is important to Scotty. It's not explored all that much in Classic Trek, but it's at the very heart of Relics, the episode of TNG where Scotty is discovered suspended in the transporter of a crashed ship and brought aboard the Enterprise D. In that episode, Scotty finds himself adrift and without purpose, not because of the technology so much, but because he's a man out of time. Captain Picard notices this and asks Geordi to include Scotty in a crucial mission because he would like for Scotty to feel useful again. Scotty's problem with the M5 isn't that the technology is too advanced. Scotty obviously has no problem with technological progress, that's Dr. McCoy's hang-up. The Enterprise, particularly its engines, are Scotty's pride and joy. The guy studies technical manuals in his spare time and loves it. When the Enterprise undergoes a massive refit in Star Trek The Motion Picture, Scotty isn't complaining about how new and different everything is. He's standing there beaming like a proud parent. He's not anti-technology. He just wants to have a function, a purpose, something that makes him feel needed. The same is true of Kirk, I think. He wants to be useful. And more than that, he believes he is useful. He believes he, and more broadly, people in general, can be responsible for their own lives and deserve the freedom and power to make their own decisions. And Star Trek is telling us that he's right. Automation is great. Technology can help to improve our lives. Computers can, as Spock says, be incredibly helpful servants, but they shouldn't become our masters. We should employ technology in ways that add to the quality and meaning of our lives, not subtract from it. Captain Kirk doesn't come into conflict with every computer he runs across during Classic Trek, only the ones that are threatening the lives and freedom of people. And every one of those conflicts ends with Kirk triumphant and the computer either a dead smoking hulk or blown to smithereens. The intentions of the writers of those episodes is clear. We are not supposed to root for the steam drill. <laughs>